Uh, as for uh, Lisa Majaj, uh, I have to also be a little biased. And, and the first thing I asked her was, Betty Majaj, Dr. Amin Majaj, are they, what's the connection? Incredibly proud of this family of doctors who have really uh, made you know, documentation in Jerusalem. They've changed the structure of Jerusalem as we know it, in my opinion. She's a Palestinian-American poet and scholar who also is uh, published. Uh, she was born in Iowa and was raised in Jordan. She earned a BA in English literature from the American University of Beirut and an MA in English literature and an MA in American culture and a PhD in American culture from the University of Michigan. So I'll begin with three quotes. The first is Milan Kundera from the Book of Laughter and Forgetting. The first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory. The second is by Rana Barakat from the anthology Seeking Palestine. Palestine was and continues to be subject to a kind of erasure unparalleled in modern history. And the third is by the novelist Susan Abulhawa. My stories are the stuff of my intifada. Palestinian experience has long been played out through a series of erasures. Lines on the map, people on the land, villages, homes, trees, history itself. How to forge a viable future in the face of this erasure is perhaps the most fundamental question facing Palestinians. But the future is defined by the past, and like everything else in Palestine, the past is contested territory. Palestinian history and memory are subjected to structural and discursive mechanisms of silencing and intentional erasure, what scholars and historians have termed memoricide, the destruction of memory. Palestinian literature represents what, might, what one might call a project of de-memoricide, writing texts that consciously seek to reclaim history and memory and make it central to Palestinian experience. Diaspora writers have played a particular role in this pod project, negotiating history, memory, and creative imagination to voice the Palestine to which they may have little access, but which is still central to their lives. Their work is significant for the visibility they are able to bring to Palestinian issues, but also for what it says about the difficulties of claiming space for Palestine. The term memoricide was brought to visibility in the Palestinian context um, in part by Israeli historian Ilan Pape's 2006 book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. But the concept of erasure, both physical and discursive, has of course been fundamental to Palestinian experience. Through the systematic raising of Palestinian villages and the obscuring of rubble by forests of European pines, the destruction of cemeteries and archeological sites, institutionalized and state-sponsored Nakba denial, exclusion of Palestinian history from textbooks, censorship so extreme a poem can lead to a jail sentence, or a wholesale rewriting of history intended to expunge Palestinians from the land, the map, the historical record, and public and private awareness. As Palestinian-American author Sohal Jurf notes, many Jews and Israelis do not even use the word Palestine nor Palestinian. Using these words would be an admission of the existence of both. An Arab-American comedian, Dean Obadallah, comments, people will tell me to my face that there has never been a Palestine and there are no such things as Palestinians. To them, I guess, Palestinians are simply holograms. Obadallah's metaphor is striking. A hologram, a photographic recording of a light field, records not a subject, but the light scattered from that subject. To be a hologram suggests that both material existence and representational agency have been disrupted, reducing one to a mere register of dispersal. In many ways, of course, this is not an inaccurate description. But what we might call the hologram effect is not a natural outcome of exile. Rather, it is the result of the century-long refusal both to see and to allow visibility to Palestinians and Palestinian history and experience. Both the refusal of what Edward Said called the permission to narrate and what Ramona Afana, Afana describes as a kind of structural unseeing, a willed blindness to both past and present events. It's important to note that this erasure is not just of what occurred during the Nakba, but of what was there before the Nakba. Palestine is a fully functioning society and culture, a land inhabited by people and by a people. In this sense, the task of countering memoricide is to insist on Palestine's existence, both in the context of the historical rupture of the Nakba and outside of this rupture, to rescue Palestine from history and at the same time restore it to history. Writers play a particular role in this task. As Mahmoud Darwish points out, while any writer's role inherently involves a search for truth, in Palestine, this search takes on, quote, the form of a confrontation with the attempts to erase our people from the memory of history and from the map of this place, unquote. 
This requires counter-narrative that must battle not just structural, but also internal barriers to narration, as well as the complexities of post-memory, what Marianne Hirsch has defined as, quote, the relationship that the generation after bears to the personal, collective, and cultural trauma of those who came before, unquote. For Palestinian Americans, it has taken a long time to come to voice. We have significant exceptions, but it's been a bit slow because of the mechanisms of suppression and silencing. The silencing has shaped not only the Nakba generation, but younger generations growing up in families where the focus is on survival in a hostile environment. As Rasha Abul Hadi, a queer Southern Palestinian American writes, we have hidden so, so well that we will soon be lost. One example of such silencing is Soha el jerfs narrative, Even My Voice is Silence. A speech-language pathologist in the US, el jerf interrogates her relationship to Palestine, to home, to selfhood, and to voice through personal memory, family memory, communal memory, post-memory, the absence of memory, and even dream memory. It's a difficult exploration permeated with silences of various kinds. el jerfs father came from the destroyed village of al Khairiya. Al Jerf was born in Palestine but grew up in the US, and Palestine was silenced in her home environment out of an attempt to protect the children. But a yearning permeates her narrative for Palestine, for selfhood, for belonging, for a voice that can narrate these interwoven elements. As a speech pathologist, Al Jerf helps patients recover their obstructed voices, but she herself struggles with the process of reclaiming memory. Her text opens with a contemplation of the single photo her father possesses from his life in Palestine. Quote, a frame filled with black and white stillness that evidences a life continuously lived, unquote. Longing for a connection to that life, she travels to Palestine and accompanies children from Halazon refugee camp on an expedition to their family's destroyed villages and to her own. At the site of her father's village, absence is overlaid with desecration. What initially seems a pile of dirt, perhaps some grass, is in fact a huge crater filled with filth. Her guide confirms, yes, your father's land has now been converted by Israel into a garbage dump. The sense of dissociation in the text is profound. The narrative moves swiftly to the statement, and now they say we are in Al Ramla, we are here and we are there, but we are really nowhere. This nowhere is an erasure not only of the physical past, of history, but also of the ability of the individual to reside in, speak of, speak in history. Later in her narrative, El Jerf returns to this moment. She says she had thought, quote, maybe I would stand on that land and the tangled double helix might just reconfigure itself so that all that was jumbled inside of me would unjumble. But she's forced to acknowledge that, quote, the void on which my father's village once stood the absolute nullity of everything is a deep part of my history that traces itself back to no trace of anything. Silence is, of course, a common response to trauma. One way to bring the suppressed past to voice is to, doc to, voice is to document facts, to claim space in recorded history. Algerf suggests that individual narratives may also emerge from a kind of collective unconscious, a group history that shapes individuals on a deep level. When she narrates her, fa her, family's, her father's Nakba experience, including the death of an infant during the family's flight, which one finds in Nakba narratives, she depends on information that came to her in a dream. And it's after that dream that she goes to her mother and asks and finds out about this suppressed family trauma. Strikingly, she chooses to narrate in her book not the factual version of this loss, but the dream version. It's a decision that highlights both the, the complexities of reclaiming traumatic memory and the role of, of Palestinian experience of a deep communal memory. So it's, it's a very interesting, I don't have time to go into it, but it's a very interesting thing that she does. I was at first disturbed by it, and then I realized it raises so many issues. Literature plays a significant role in communicating the emotional layers of belonging and dispossession at the heart of Palestinian experience. Indeed, despite recent decades of historical scholarship and activist work in combating memoricide, it's notable that after 75 years of trying to convey the Palestinian story through history and journalism, some of the most significant breakthroughs have actually come through the work of creative writers. In particular, Palestinian-American Susan Abulhawa, sorry, Susan Abulhawa, oh God, you should have told me before, <laughs> sorry, whose first novel, Mornings in Janine, was translated into 32 languages 
and sold over a million copies, making her, according to one source, the most widely read Palestinian author of all time. Abulhawa's sweeping multi-generational novels, informed by a deep sense of communal memory and historical rootedness, insist not only on the devastation of the Nakba and ongoing oppression, but also on a Palestine that continues despite erasure and dispersal. Speaking of her own biography, born in Kuwait to refugee parents, shuttled between Kuwait, Jordan, the US, and Palestine, enduring deep family dysfunction, Abulhawa says she felt she, quote, didn't belong anywhere but to a political discussion called the question of Palestine, but came to understand that, quote, my life represents the most basic truth about what it means to be Palestinian, dispossessed, disinherited, exiled, and what it ultimately means to resist. In the opening of her first novel, Mornings in Janine, a soldier presses a gun into the protagonist Amal's forehead. In that moment of looming death, memory pulls her back to a time and space before the rupture of the Nakba, to a home she had never known. This space exists in a time before time, described in lyrical terms. Quote, before history marched over the hills and shattered present and future, before wind grabbed the land at one corner and shook it of its name and character, a small village east of Haifa lived quietly on figs and olives, open frontiers and sunshine. Meanwhile, the moment when the Nakba shatters time, steals the past and destroys present and future, encapsulate, encapsulates the entire Palestinian saga. And she writes, and actually she writes about the village we saw, Ein Hod. So it was that eight centuries after its founding by a general of Saladin's army in 1189, Ein Hud was cleared of its Palestinian children. Forty generations of living now stolen. In the sorrow of a history buried alive, the year 1948 in Palestine fell from the calendar into exile, ceasing to reckon the marching count of days, months, and years, instead becoming an infinite mist of one moment in history. Abulhawa's second novel, The Blue Between Sky and Water, which was sold in 19 languages before its release, similarly, op similarly opens with an evocation of a rooted history reaching back millennia. And she, she writes, a village of villages surrounded by gardens and olive groves and bordered to the north by a lake. In the 13th century, Beit Dadas was on the mail route from Cairo to Damascus. It boasted a caravana serai for the steady stream of travelers who flowed across the trade routes of Asia, North Africa, and Southeastern Europe. The Mamluks had built it in AD, AD 1325. Overlooking Beit Dadas were the remnants of a castle built by the Crusaders in the early 1100s, perched on a citadel that had been built by Alexander the Great more than a millennium before that. This description embeds Beit Dadas in a long span of deeply rooted history. But another history arrives in the guise of the Haganah, and, quote, Beit Dadas was carried off by the wind, unquote. Forced to flee to Gaza, itself described as the beacon crossroad between North Africa, the Middle East, and Europe, the hub of the spice trade, the people of Beit Dadas walk, quote, without words away from their lives, unquote. Threading the gaps between Beit Dadas and the Gaza refugee camp, between the stolen past, the enduring present, and the de denied future, is the voice of a mysterious character named Khaled, who first appears in the narrative as the character Mariam's imaginary friend, and then as a child born into a subsequent generation. His commentary bridges the gaps between Palestine before and Palestine after, evoking the simultaneous possibility and impossibility of Palestine. This in-between state is reflected in the strange song that weaves in and out of the narrative, evoking a surreal space outside history where Palestine is not erased, a blue between sky and water where all time is now and we are the forever flowing like a river. In such passages, Abulhawa voices a narrative that attempts to speak beyond the mechanisms of destruction, silencing, and erasure, while making clear the difficulties of doing so. In a passage which appears almost verbatim in both the novel and an autobiographical essay, a fact that points toward the deep intersection between history, autobiography, and creative expression in Palestinian narratives, Abulhawa writes, to be alone without papers, without a family or a clan, a land or a country, means that one must live at the mercy of others. Such disjunction represents another kind of memoricide. Given the realities of ongoing Nakba disappearing Palestine, the dispossession and dispersal of exile, imagining a future is difficult. And we see this, there's a, an anthology, um, Palestine Plus 100, that imagines Palestine in uh, 100 years after, after 1948, and they're very dystopian portray portrayals. But texts like Abul Hawa's suggest that one way to keep Palestine alive is through the intersection of memory and imagination. 
At one point, Khaled, in a coma-like state after an Israeli attack, thinks to himself, how do I tell Mama of this freedom that there is a Beit Daras in a Palestine without soldiers where we can all go? It's clear that this idyllic space only exists inside of him. Similarly, the surreal elements of the narrative suggest that a free Palestine might only exist in that impossible blue between sky and water, which is very remin reminiscent of Darwish's line, where do the birds fly after the last sky? But if there is any space for hope, it is also located in that in-between space. Near the end of the book, the Gazans, caged in by Israeli fences and snipers and warships, gather to play the tabla, dance, sing, and watch the moon rise, finding hope and freedom despite their impossible situation. And one of them mumbles to herself, my mother once said this land will rise again. The project of dememoricide seeks to rescue the past from erasure and, and in so doing, shape the present and future, a task that requires not only endurance, but imagination. The silences of al text and the surreal elements of Abul Hawa's point toward the difficulty of narrating a Palestine under erasure. Under erasure. But literature plays a crucial role in the attempt to keep Palestine alive. As Abul Hawa reminds us, our stories are a form of resistance, an intifada. Thank you. <laughs>